You know, despite all of the emojis and grammar police on social media these days, we all know the importance of reading and writing here in our world. Education is a building block to our society. And naturally, as society changes, attitudes and techniques for life and education change over time as well. Now, to chat about this in more detail, especially about reading, writing, but not arithmetic, and the changes to education over the years, is the interim dean of the Faculty of Education at the University of Lethbridge, Dr. Robin Bright. Dr. Bright, welcome to Bridge City News. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. Now, you had a pretty distinguished career in education, and I'm sure that during your time as an educator, much has changed over the years. Is there something you feel has been the biggest change in education? What has really jumped out for you? Well, I think um, in terms of my area, which is reading instruction, I think there's been a change in emphasis over the years. Um, so, for instance, when I first started teaching, we talked a lot about the reading wars and there being a debate about how best to teach reading and over the over the last several decades I think we think it's we've received I think more clarity in terms of what really matters in teaching reading uh, and so I think we're in a different place uh, for educators and for parents to really know what matters when it comes to teaching reading so I would say that's probably one of the biggest uh, changes or things that evo have evolved over the last uh, 20 to 30 years you know, I remember when I was a kid, my friends would say, I want to kick back with a good book. Do you still hear young people saying that today? Well, I would say you hear it sometimes. Um, it's probably not necessarily um, an activity that many kids gravitate to first. However, a lot depends on, you know, how they've been, um, how reading has been talked about in their homes, how uh, effective teachers and librarians have been in encouraging them to read. So in schools, I think uh, teachers are doing a really good job at helping students find books that really matter to them so that they can do just, as you say, kick back and enjoy a good book. Uh, but there are a lot of things competing with kids' time right now. So it does make it a little bit more difficult. Yeah, especially social media, you know, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or TikTok. I mean, it just goes on and on and on, which takes up a lot of children's time. Now, what would you say are the challenges for students and for educators in this year that were maybe not in consideration 20 years ago outside of social media? Well, I, I mean, you, you've raised the most important one, and that is that there's so much uh, time for screens. And unfortunately, you know, if it's not monitored, then that can be a really negative influence in, in children's lives. Um, there's a fabulous site called Media Smarts, which I, you know, go to a lot in order to look at new research that's available. And they give you some really great ideas about how to monitor screen time. Uh, for instance, children under the age of two, you know, most um, most experts are saying should not have any screen time or very, very little because it interferes with the development of language. Uh, it makes them a little bit less interested in the world around them. And then from that age up, it's just really important to monitor the time that kids spend uh, online and also to become sort of be part of it with kids so that it's not something that they do all on their own. There's time for education, um, thinking about what it is that you're you're doing. Uh, but screen time would be the big uh, change, I think, in children's lives over the last several decades. You know, and as a parent, you know, myself, I have two kids, they're in their 20s now, but I remember when my daughter was 10 or 11 years old and she wanted to start up a Facebook account. And I'm really concerned, like a lot of other parents, about predators who are out there going after our children, posing as someone else. You know, so you have to really be careful about where your kids are going online and at what age at the same time. So how do you see teachers and educators evolving, Dr. Bright? evolving with their techniques to counteract the changes that we see in society today. Well, if we are talking specifically about young children, and especially coming out of uh, a pandemic, one of the things I think that teachers are really focused on is how to set the foundations for early reading. And, you know, some children miss those opportunities by not being in school over the last, you know, on a regular basis over the last several years. So one of the ways that uh, teachers of young children are helping to combat this is by making sure that they are focused on, I think, two really important aspects when it comes to teaching reading oral language, so helping children to, you know, have those conversations, uh, sing, 
I uh, use chants, rhyming, lots of mother goose, uh, because they've missed out on those kinds of opportunities to really develop a strong oral language base upon which you know, learning to read is based. Uh, so they're they're moving children from this, you know, really environment that focuses on on oral language into you know written language. And in written language, of course, they're focused on how language works. So really helping kids understand that sound symbol relationship, getting them to understand that it's important to sound outwards. Um, and using writing too. Watching children write naturally helps helps teachers figure out how they're making sense of language when they're learning to read. So I think that's what I'm seeing um, teachers, especially in the early grades, kindergarten through grade three, uh, focus on with their students. You know, it's interesting now I'll sit down with a pen to paper, try my cursive writing because I'm on a keyboard all day. <laughs> I've kind of lost the knack here. It's like, ooh, that does not look good at all. That, 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 that looks kind of, I, I need to practice this a little bit more, you know. Is it like they say, if you don't use it, you lose it, I guess. Now, we've heard a lot about changes to the curriculum here in our province in Alberta. Can you speak to the new curriculum in kindergarten through grade three? Do you think it will benefit kids and improve learning outcomes? Yeah, so, um, yeah, the new curriculum has come in, and I think teachers have had an opportunity over the last little while, certainly we have in teacher education, to really examine what's in there. And what I'll say is the focus on beginning reading um, is not bad. As a matter of fact, I think it's helped teachers recognize um, how important the foundational skills in learning to read are. But I would say there are things that are still missing from that curriculum and, and that teachers want to be uh, aware of and make sure that their programs um, also encapsulate. So for instance, uh, reading to children, um, demonstrating how important fluency is. So when kids hear teachers read out loud to them, uh, interesting stories, stories that they, they want to be a, a part of, that, that is as important as setting those foundational skills where children are learning to sound outwards. So while I think it's a great way to emphasize the foundational reading skills, uh, I think as teachers and as researchers, we don't want to forget that there are many other aspects to a really strong literacy program that we don't want to overlook. And I would say one of them for sure is developing that oral language. Another is reading out loud to kids. Another one is writing, making sure children have lots of opportunities to scribble and draw and, you know, make letters. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that I just think the new curriculum doesn't address as strongly as it does those uh, those foundational reading skills, which really refer to, to font, developing phonics knowledge and what we call phonemic awareness, but really what they refer to is is word work you know decoding words uh, but I think the, the great thing is we're talking about beginning reading in a way that I don't know that we've done for for uh, a while now you know and I'm sure that the engagement of parents is critical for a child's learning and the way they think and the way they formulate their personalities you know I'm thinking back to when I was a child and my parents would sometimes read me Bible stories which I thought was kind of cool learning about Jesus learning about David and Goliath and Samson some powerful stories in God's Word and at the same time there were nursery rhymes too which were a lot of fun as well how important is it to have the parents engaged in their children's lives at such an early age when it comes to reading yeah, it, it's essential, truly. And it it um, it sets a foundation. It makes children realize that reading is important. So I would say that uh, for parents, one of the most important things you can do is read to and with your children. Um, find the amazing array of children's literature that's available in libraries. Uh, if if you don't have a library card or you're not visiting the library yet, it's never too late to start the habit. Librarians are absolutely brilliant at helping to match readers to texts that will matter to them and be interesting to them. Uh, and they can be texts like uh, a silly text like Dog Man and Captain Underpants. And they can be, you know, more traditional stories like The Secret Garden. Uh, but there's so many books in between between those those two formats and genres so you can you can really get kids interested in text by helping to make sure you understand how much is available out there so yes we may remember our familiar you know our favorite text but in this day and age there is so much 
much Canadian and really great Canadian children's and young adult literature that there is just, there's no excuse not to find uh, the book that matches the reader. You know, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm, I'm kind of curious as to why children sometimes fall behind when it comes to their reading skills, you know, their comprehension and, and what they take in, what they absorb. Is it because maybe sometimes the subject matter really doesn't interest them that much? Well, there can be a variety of reasons, truly, for, for um, you know, uh, declining student interest in reading. Yes, you're correct. Sometimes it is the, the actual topic might be uh, less interesting. It could be the format, too. So parents often ask me, you know, is it all right for my child to be reading graphic novels? Shouldn't they be reading? And sometimes they use this term, real books. Uh, but graphic novels are um, extremely complex and they do contain interesting storylines and characters and and um, uh, and and the interesting thing about graphic novels is because there's not as much text in them as there might be in more traditional books kids have to engage in comprehension skills in a way that they might not have to in in other texts especially the uh, the skill of inferencing and that simply means that you have to figure out you know, what's happening in a story when it is not said directly. Uh, so yes, they're, they're, they are great kinds of texts, but there are many different reasons why children's interest might decline. So we've talked about interest, but it could also because be because of a certain reading skill. So decoding, you know, could uh, be a struggle for students. Fluency could be a struggle as well. So not being able to read at the same speed at which you speak. Um, and if that's a problem, you know, there are many strategies that, that teachers know about and will engage kids in, in order to, you know, develop that particular skill. Uh, but teachers are pretty good at figuring out where the problem lies and then, you know, taking the, the necessary uh, interventions that, that might be needed. I remember in school, we were forced to read this book called Watership Down about a bunch of bunny rabbits going to work. And I got to tell you, it was the most boring thing. And I fell asleep and I lost interest. But fortunately, around the same time, the movie came out, Watership Down. Like, this is great. I just go see the movie and do the book report on that. Unfortunately, the ending of the movie was totally different from the book. So needless <laughs> to say, it didn't end very well for, for Hal here. But anyway, right. <laughs> digital readers are now used in schools quite a bit, Dr. Bright. Do you see the increase in technology as a benefit or does maybe research show something a little different. Well, technology and teaching reading through things like ebooks and digital reading programs are being used, and I think they're being used effectively in, in classrooms. Um, the evidence is, is sort of mixed in terms of the effect that they have. So the, um, the literature that I've reviewed in this area tends to show that it doesn't it, it doesn't necessarily contribute to effective um, uh, statistically significant gains. Uh, however, it may very well be something that is a really interesting to some students and might hook them into reading in a way that um, traditional kinds of reading might not. Uh, but they're being used in classrooms um, and they're they're technological tools that I think can be effective for, for some students and interesting for some students. But overall, um, they're not necessarily uh, a panacea uh, in terms of, of, you know, really uh, contributing to uh, better reading skills overall for children. You know, with teenagers nowadays, the competition for eyeballs and attention you talk about in some ways to engage teens in reading and writing, how else can we do it outside of maybe e-books and the traditional books that we get at the library? Well, there, there are a number of things that I know teachers and librarians do. Um, I, book talks is one of the most effective ways, and I've been very fortunate to be um, invited into a number of schools where the teacher and the librarian and I will simply uh, bring forward a uh, ton of new books on a variety of topics and we'll talk just for a couple of minutes we'll try to leave kids a bit on a, a cliffhanger uh, to get them really interested in new texts and I've I've seen that really work because um, 
not one person can't really know all the books that are out there, but a group of, of teachers and, and parents and librarians can get together and share a number of different books with, with children and try to pique their interest. So book talking is something that we really stress as being a, a creative strategy that teachers can use. Um, the other thing is um, helping kids talk together about books. Often they can really influence one another. So having kids, you know, get together in small groups in libraries and in classrooms and talk a little bit about the last book that they read uh, can also encourage their peers to become more excited and interested. But I will say, you know, what happens in the home is really, really important. And so I think, you know, parents just taking that active interest in what their kids are reading, introducing books to them. And if they're not, you know, strong readers themselves, you know, sharing a book together can be a great experience. So reading a book together, uh, even, even as children get older into the middle grades can be a really rewarding experience. It's all about developing those building blocks. Dr. Robin Wright is Interim Dean at the Faculty of Education at the University of Lethbridge. Dr. Bright, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you very much. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and thanks for watching.